I always tell my, my own grown children, I say, if you don't like the way I am, it's your fault you made me this way. I, I, I didn't set out to be. <clears throat> uh, Philemon may be one of the, maybe it is the shortest book in the Bible, uh, but uh, Paul was a master rhetorician, and he crams more in these 25 verses, um, by the way, by way of the tricks of the trade, of persuasion, than you can imagine even as possible. So my plan for today is to read it. I have the Greek in front of me because the English doesn't uh, convey everything. It's, translation is one of the most difficult uh, tasks uh, human beings undertake to bright, try to bring the nuance and flavor of a language over into another language is just nearly impossible. But uh, I have the Greek here in front of me so that I remember to highlight uh, the nuances Paul has put in. My plan today is to read through very carefully and I'll comment on some things. I want you to be listening for repetition, uh, words that occur more than once, and concepts. I want you to be listening for uh, how especially Paul portrays himself over against the other people he mentions. There are a lot of names in this short little book. Uh, uh, what kind of language does he use? Um, what atmosphere is he creating thereby? And after we've done that, I'm going to draw a couple, three observations and, and make some points uh, uh, after we've seen this together. Be, be, uh, be paying attention to uh, the effect this is going to have on uh, the readership, uh, who Paul intended the, uh, the book for originally. No, that is Philemon, right? You be Philemon and listen to this. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, my brother, my is implied, the brother Timothy, it says, to Philemon, the beloved and our fellow, our fellow worker, and to Appia, the sister, and to Archippo, our fellow soldier, and to all the church that meets in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what did you hear a lot of there? What kind of language? Fellow. fellow. Paul loves that. There's a, you do that with a simple, in almost any Greek verb or noun, it's the Greek preposition suin. We get sim, S-Y-M from it. So, and it means together with. So sympathetic means to be, to feel along with someone. The symphony, phone is sound. It means you get a group of instrumentalists together and they make a sound together. That's a symphony, right? And you can think of it also symmetry. When uh, something measures equally, measures together, both sides are alike. And all those sim words. Paul sticks sim on front of almost its, uh, uh, our, uh, he calls uh, Philemon our fellow worker. He mentions Archippo as our fellow soldier. And, and be listening because there's going to be more of those. What other kind of language did you hear in that introduction to this letter? Well, there were different roles. Uh, all of them have to do with striving together in the gospel. Did you notice how much family language there is there? Uh, Timothy, our brother. Uh, Aphia, our sister. Be listening for more of that. Now, this introduction, and, and how is Paul portrayed? A prisoner, right? So here we have prisoner Paul, humble, you know, in a low state. And did you notice also that this letter, which we call the letter to Philemon, also mentions um, Aphia and Archippo and, and beyond them, the church that meets in your house. So it's a household church. It meets at Philemon's house. And the letter is written to Philemon and all those other people. Now that means it would probably have been read out loud in their next worship service after they got it, which means that although Paul's really talking to Philemon, He's making sure that the whole church is overhearing the conversation, right? So it would be as if I said, now, Drake, I want to talk to you, and I want you all to hear it, right? 
And now what I have to say to Drake, is going to, he's going to know you all have all heard it. Right. Okay, let's go on. I thank my God whenever I make remember, remembrance of you in my prayers. Now, uh, Paul's letters, with the exception of the letter to Galatians, and he was mad at them, all have the same uh, outline. He first does this greeting we've already heard, and then he gives a, offers thanksgiving for the recipients. He says, I thank you for you. I'm always thankful for you people in Philippi because you're so wonderful. I'm thankful for you, Philemon. Now, th this thanksgiving is going to be uh, comparable a little bit to some flattery, okay? So he's going to say why he thinks Philemon is so wonderful, and let's listen to what Philemon's strengths are supposed to be, as Paul describes them. I thank my God whenever I make mem remembrance of you in, in my prayers. Hearing of your love and faith, which you have, put a period here. I'm going to struggle with prepositions. Uh, Greek prepositions are awful uh, in, try, in trying to figure out exactly what their nuance is in English. Uh, I thank my God, uh, hearing of your love and faith, which you have pros the Lord Jesus, to or for the Lord Jesus, and ice into or for. If it both means for, why did he use two different prepositions? And in all the saints. Now, I think that's one of the most uh, intriguing statements in the Bible. I, uh, I, hearing of your love and faith for God and in all the saints. Unto all the saints. Does it mean your love for God and your faith in the saints? Or does it mean your love and your faith for God and for the saints? We can understand Faith in God. What would faith in all the saints be? Think about that. He's uh, praising, as it were, Philemon for having such confidence, not only love, but confidence in all the saints. And by the way, saints in this context means fellow Christians, right? Uh, for all the confidence you have in all your fellow Christians. Let that sink in a minute. It's, it's going to come pay off for Paul later on. So that your, let's see, the fellowship of your faith, the fellowship of your faith. Uh, this is going to be a big word in this short letter too, fellowship. Koinonia, you've heard of this. It was a big deal, big word uh, back in the 70s in the church. We were always talking about koinonia. I mean, it's literally having together. Be, you know, being a big fellowship, sharing, partnering. So that your, uh, the fellowship of your faith may be energized in the knowledge of all the good which is in us unto Christ or for Christ. All the good which is in us, including you, Philemon, when there's good in you, you're a good man for Christ. For I have much joy and encouragement because of your love, because the hearts of the, of the saints are refreshed through you, brother. More, more family language. The hearts, by the way, that word is uh, I translated that loosely. It's plagna in Greek, and it means guts or bowels. Uh, the Greeks didn't, the Greeks, you know, we think, we, we, you think with your head, in, in our parlance, you think with your head and you feel in your heart, right? They didn't do that. You think in your heart in Greek world and you feel in your guts. But if you think about your own biological responses to uh, when you have really strong feelings, where do you feel things? You feel them in your gut, right, yeah. Uh, you have butterflies or something. Now notice, uh, he is described, Brother Philemon has someone who loves and has faith and confidence in all the saints, and who is known for his uh, love that refreshes the saints, right? So he's a good guy. 
Wherefore, verse 8, having great confidence or boldness in Christ to command you to do the thing that which is appropriate. Now, compare great love and all that kind of stuff to just what's appropriate. You know, just to bear, just do, do the, the right thing. Uh, that's, that's a lower standard, right, than the kind of agape love that pours out. So Paul is saying, now look, because of your uh, reputation, because I know who you are, I have the confidence, the boldness in Christ to give you an order to do the right thing. Yeah, I could. I am going to encourage you instead, rather, because of love or through love. Now, and then you've got a parenthetical here. Now, this being, the one speaking here, being old Paul. I'm old Paul. I'm Paul the old man in prison. I'm Paul, Paul. I could order you to do this, but I don't want to. I'd rather you do it out of love. Right? Because you love me and you love the saints. I'm not. Do you hear what's happening here? Old Paul. By the way, the word for old is presbytes. Uh, you get Presbyterian from it. So you could argue that he says, now I'm a Presbyterian, I'm Presbyterian Paul asking you to do that. And he says, being old Paul, now, not, now also a prisoner for Christ Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Philemon said, I'll, you know, Philemon's not going to say, well, I don't care if you are old Paul in prison. I ain't going to do what you tell. You see how he's setting him up. Uh, he's using the technique my mother and many mothers always used on me. Now, I don't want to have to tell you to do it, son, because I would rather you just did it because, you know. No, it's the right thing to do, you know, and it'd break my heart if you don't do the right thing, but you can do whatever you want. He said, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather, you, I'd rather encourage you, me old Paul in prison for Christ. I encourage you, namely, concerning my son, my child, warlock family language, right? So we got, we got brothers and sisters and fathers and children going here. Whom I begot in my imprisonment. Now, he's using begot here. Paul didn't have children. As far as we know, he wasn't married. He's using this language figuratively. Onesimus. The one who was formerly useless, but now is useful both to me and both to you and to me, whom I am sending to you, he who is my own heart. Splagna again. So I'm sending, the likelihood is, by the way, there was no postal, Roman postal service. The likelihood is that this Onesimus was carrying the letter that he took back to Philemon with him on his journey. So Paul says, I've sent him back to you. And the implication is, along with this letter. What's going on here? Why? why? Whom I, I, I wanted to keep for myself or to myself. In order that he might serve me in my imprisonment for the gospel on your behalf. So there is some relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. He said, I wanted to keep Onesimus so that he could do service to me in your stead or on your behalf. But apart from your consent, I didn't want to do anything. So that uh, your goodness may not be by compulsion, but rather through free will, free choice, your own decision. 
Huh. What are we talking about here? Let's see a little bit. For perhaps, for, for perhaps through this, he might be apart for a while so that he may be, you may have him back for eternity. No longer as a slave. Now, now we've gotten to it. Apparently, Onesimus was an escaped slave who belonged to Philemon. And now, Paul is sending him back with this letter. No longer as a slave, but much more than a slave. As a beloved, what do you expect? Brother. It's better for me, how much more than for you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, what do we mean when we say Onesimus was Philemon's brother? Well, in the flesh, but mostly in the Lord. Oh dear. If therefore you consider me a partner, and the word there is koinonon, a noun from koinonia. If you consider that we have fellowship, you and I, one with another, receive him as you would me, Paul says. Now, if he has done you some wrong or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. Now, pause there. Uh, that would have been unusual. There are a couple places in, in Paul's letters where toward the end he says, I'm adding this in my own hand, you know, to sort of, um, you, would have, you would have hired what, 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 the, what we, would call it, we call an amanuensis, a professional scribe with good handwriting. I need one of those, but uh, we don't have them anymore. And Paul would have dictated his letters, which explains perhaps why sometimes they ramble so. Um, the grammar and syntax of Paul's letters can drive you crazy. He can have a sentence that goes on seven, eight verses. Translators usually break them in two, uh, or in triple, or in quadruple. But to, to try to piece them together, it just, you now what's, you'll have a relative clause, who, and you have to go back and find who that was way back up yonder. Uh, and so sometimes he would, uh, he would put something in his own hand toward the end. And he's written this whole letter himself, which adds to the weight of it. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay. If he owes you anything, I'll pay for it. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. You know, there it is again. You know, not, not, I won't mention that I bore you from my own body and gave up my youth and beauty and nearly killed me. I, you know, I heard this a lot. I was a breech birth back in the day when those were not easily handled. And, and if I didn't, if I was misbehaving in some particular fashion, I heard the story of my birth all, you know, all over again. No, you just can't do this to me. After all, I went to bring you to this world and it was a 14-hour labor and I reached birth and I had to call in a specialist from Gadsden and I nearly died. Would you please pick up your, <laughs> your socks? You know, it was, it was terrible. And Paul's doing that now. What does he mean? He probably, he pro probably, Paul is probably the one who converted Philemon to Christianity. And he's reminding Philemon that from that perspective, he and Onesimus are on the same level. Right. I, I won Onesimus one. I, I brought Onesimus, I brought the gospel to Onesimus while he while I was in prison. And and I'm sending back your brother to you. Right? We won't mention, you know, and she owe me. <laughs> yes, brother. Let me benefit from you. And the word is onimane. We get Onesimus from it. Let me benefit from you in the Lord. 
refresh, and that's the word he used earlier. You have the reputation for refreshing the hearts of the saints. Refresh me, refresh my heart in Christ. Whoa. Being confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do, you see, that which I say, you will do much more than I say. And I love the, the ending because it accomplishes a couple of things. Now, uh, let's, this is a letter from a man in prison. What's, what's he going to do about it if Onesimus, I mean, if Philemon just disregards this letter? Nothing. Nothing. At the same time, prepare me a guest room, for I hope that through your prayers, I will be brought to you again. In other words, oh, and by the way, I think I'm going to get out of jail soon, and the first thing I'm going to do is come see you. And I will know firsthand. Now, this is another thing. Uh, the the uh, introduction mentions that it comes from Paul and Timothy. So Timothy knows this letter's been written. He helped write it. Is he in prison with Paul? No. Not so far as we know. But prison in those days wasn't really, sometimes wasn't like it was, like it is now. They didn't, uh, they didn't uh, do much to provide for the needs of a prisoner. If you didn't have family and friends who'd bring you something to eat and that kind of thing from outside, you were in trouble. And the best we can tell from putting all the Paul's letters together, they talk about his imprisonment. There was quite a community that had followed Paul and was there to take care of, him, including all the people I'm about to mention. Uh, the following greets you. Epaphras, who's mentioned also probably under the name of Epaphroditus in the Philippian letter. My fellow prisoner, now he was in jail with him, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Mark, who is by legend the author of one of the Gospels, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, another, according to legend, Gospel writer, my fellow worker, and then it ends abruptly, Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. So, everybody in, in Philemon's house church heard this letter read. L Timothy, Mark, Luke, Matthew and John almost. Mark, Luke, Epaphras, all of these people know the content. These are, these are big names in the early church. Know the contents of this letter. Is, is Paul put any, any, you know, any pressure on Philemon? Huh? A lot, lot of heat. A lot of gentle, you know, subtle. Uh, I, think, I think this is, a, you know, in a way, a funny book. Because I can imagine, you know, <laughs> uh, Onesimus says, I have a letter from Paul. Philemon says, I love him. He said, no, it's not addressed. He's stretched. You and the whole church wait and read it Sunday. All right? And so the first time Philemon here, I mean, He's listening his call. He, or, he, or he just went ahead and, and welcomed Onesimus as a, as a brother and went over. We don't know the answer to that. Uh, depends on whether Paul's characterization of him as being so open-hearted and loving and warm and having faith in all the saints. Have faith in all the saints, right? Onesimus is a saint now, by Paul's definition. Um, uh, Philemon's got to have faith in him too. Right, if he's going to be consistent, this is. Do you see how masterful this is? His oratory and rhetoric. Uh, it's it, Paul couldn't be sure that uh, Philemon would do what he wanted him to, but boy, he loaded this letter up to be as sure as he possibly could be. I am your father, as it were, in the faith, just as I am Onesimus' father in the faith. You two are brothers. And the faith. Do you see all of this? Do you have comments or questions? How would you like to have gotten a letter like this from your dad or your mom? About a, about a squabble with, you, with your brother or sister, right? 
you're disarmed. But Philemon was disarmed to begin. No hope. <laughs> yes. Uh, I understand the story, I think. Right. I'm going to sit down. All right, we'll transition now into that. I said, and I'm going to sit down. My, my, I'm feeling all of those up, Papas, uh, this morning. Yeah, I'm putting the pressure on y'all. Old Grandpa Mark's going to have to sit down and talk to y'all from the chair. And then I did a stupid, did a stupid thing yesterday. We have a mile and a half long gravel drive and Right as you get to the house, there's this place where it slopes a little bit. And this rain recently just washed a gully. And I've put gravel in there a million times, and I'm tired of it. So I tried to figure out some way to terrace it with rocks and stuff. I shoveled, oh, I, don't, I don't want to know how much that, that weighed, but I shoveled some gravel yesterday. Anyway, uh, perfect question. I was going to deal with this second or third, but we'll deal with it first. Now, let's put ourselves uh, back in... Uh, this obj- that question has, brings us to observations about why we have the New Testament in the first place, especially the letters of, the Paul, the letters of Paul. Can you repeat these questions? Uh, what, um, what made people back then uh, keep this letter and put it in the Bible or something like that, right? And <clears throat> this, this tells us, some, I mean, from our perspective, we think of the Bible as just being there. It exists. It's, it's a book. Uh, no. I mean... When, when uh, whoever wrote Genesis uh, finished writing it, he or she did not think to him or herself, okay, that's the first book of the Bible, right? 65 more to go, right? We know from all kinds of evidence that in the Old Testament, um, books that we now call the Bible circulated independently. I mean, you have to think that someone estimated that to make a... Uh, you wrote on uh, leather scrolls, and someone estimated it would take like 11 sheep to make a book of, a book of Isaiah, right? And on, in scroll form, you couldn't get the Old Testament in my pickup truck. I'd have to have a trailer to go to. I mean, have, have you ever been to synagogue and seen the Torah scroll unrolled? That thing is yay big. And that's five out of 30 something. It, uh, and so in the New Testament, we know that we, that we call them the letters of Paul. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, in Rome, and we call that the Roman letter. He wrote this church to Philemon. Paul didn't write with the intention of, you know, of contributing over half of the New Testament. He, he didn't know that. We also know uh, that Paul makes reference in some of his letters to letters to churches that we don't have copies of, right? So it wasn't like, let's take Philemon and do some speculating. The issue here is how should a Christian master treat a Christian slave, right? And Paul doesn't issue the command. By the way, if I could go back in time and talk with Paul the day he was writing this letter, I would say, Paul, that's masterful. Now, there will you get to the point where you say, I could issue a command, but I'd rather you do it out of the goodness of your heart. Stop right there and issue the command. Because in the history of the reception of this book, if Paul had said, laid it out in principle, the idea of a Christian owning a fellow Christian, of a Christian owning anybody, is ridiculous, right? Get with the program, Philemon. What are you doing? And it had made it into the Bible. Guess what trouble that would have spared us over the years? Just think about it a minute. He left it in this sort of please, you know. And that, that enabled people in our part of the world, white people, Baptist ministers, and Presbyterian ministers, to just overlook it, right? Just overlook the question. But now let's, let's go back. Do you reckon that in the early church, scattered all across the Mediterranean world, that the, this problem of Christians owning slaves or Christians owning Christian slaves, you think Philemon and Onesimus were the only case of that, probably? Oh, I bet there were hundreds of thousands of cases of that. And I bet in the early church it was a real question, an issue. 
to be resolved. I can imagine the conversation going something like this in churches. Well, there's nowhere in the Bible where it prohibits slavery. Does this sound familiar? There's nowhere in the Bible that prohibits slavery. So you can't tell me I can't, you know, I've got to do otherwise. But I bet you it was, I bet you other people said, what do you mean? Christ died for all in Christ. There's neither slave nor free, Paul said. How can you think that it's right for a human being to own another human being when we're all created? Can you imagine that conversation going on back and forth? I can imagine that it nearly tore up some churches. Right? I imagine also that this letter came to the church that met in Philemon's house. And I bet you they made more than one copy of it for their own use. And I bet you one of them, maybe even Philemon, was traveling on business and was in the town next door or the town two towns away. And wh where would he have gone? He would have, for hospitality's sake, we know this from 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, other places. There, there were, you know, if you stayed in, a po in an inn in that time of the day, you were in that day, you were taking your own life, at you, you know, in your own hands. You were putting your life at risk because that was some pretty rough folks that were out traveling. And we know that the early church, uh, when you were traveling, you knocked on the door of um, fellow Christians and they, they put you up. Uh, and that's talked about, that's discussed, in, in especially for 2nd and 3rd John. So I imagine Philemon maybe or somebody else in that church going next door and they are talking over dinner and they say, you know, we've got this real problem about this slavery question. And he said, well, Paul wrote us about that. And, and we, we've got copies of the letter. And they said, can I have one? He said, oh, yeah, I'll get you one here. I think I have one here in my luggage. I can imagine that because this was an issue that confronted the whole church in the world, that that letter spread all over rather quickly. We know that by, oh, a century and a half later, that it was already being considered um, canonical, as were most of the rest of Paul's letters. You know the trouble that Paul writes about at Corinth, all that? Meat offered to idols. You reckon the Corinthians were the only one that ever had to deal with that? I reckon not. I reckon that all of Paul's letters scattered all the ones that we have, and that the, I reckon the other ones probably didn't deal with anything that anybody really, you know, was that big an issue. But the ones that dealt with stuff that the, all the whole church, the whole Hellenistic church, was dealing with, I imagine they spread all over everywhere. And that's, by the way, how they become biblical. When something uh, we, we usually talk about two criteria for canonicity. That's what makes it into the Bible. And, and with respect to the New Testament, the Old Testament is a different question. We talk about uh, apostol apostolicity. Every book in the New Testament, with the exception of Hebrews, and they, they snuck Hebrews in by claiming it was a letter of Paul. Uh, Hebrews does not say it's a letter of Paul, but the early church decided to say it was. It's not because it's not in Pauline style or theology. But every book in the New Testament has some association with an apostle defined as someone who had been with Jesus, right? Because by the time uh, that first generation began to pass away, the church first expected Jesus back in a minute, remember? And when that, that didn't happen, they thought, oh my goodness, we're soon going to have a situation where we're talking about Jesus and none of us had ever even been with him. We better get their memories written down, right? So the whole New Testament is associated with, an, every book is associated somehow or other with an apostle. Mark I mentioned, right? Uh, Luke I mentioned. The other one is what's called Catholicity. And Catholic means universal, not Roman. And the fact that these letters spread throughout the church, they were addressed to the church at Corinth, but before long, it was all over the world in churches. That means, or we say that uh, churches everywhere in all times hear God's word in this book. The universality of its distribution meant that it could be considered authoritative. You follow me? So the, the books that are in the New Testament are the books that the, I won't say the early church, by then it was, um, the New Testament canon is the first time we have it recorded 
in the form we have it now is in the Easter letter of Bishop Athanasius in North Africa that dates to 367 BCE. So by the middle of the fourth century, uh, the church had decided that these books we have are the ones that are Catholic and apostolic and can be relied on. By the way, I get all bent out of shape when I hear on, you know, TV on one of those Discovery Channel things, something about the, the books of the Bible that the church kicked out, right? And they usually have reference to the Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, some of those kinds of things. Are you familiar with that literature? Uh, there was a Time magazine issue some years ago that was the, the books that were removed from the Bible. If you'll ex pardon my French, bullcrap. Uh, they weren't removed. They never had a chance to get in. Why? They weren't apostolic. Had no association. The name Thomas didn't mean anything. There was no, uh, those, those books were written in the, th in the three and four hundreds. They had no association with Jesus. And they were not Catholic. In other words, uh, the so-called Gnostic Gospels were only circulated among the Coptic Christians in northern Egypt. They never, they never got circulation anywhere else. So they're not Catholic. They weren't kicked out. They showed up at the door and said, here are my credentials. And they said, these are fake. Not letting you in. Right. So I think that's very informative on how, how the... How, how we got the New Testament to think about Philemon and to think about what it means to be authoritative in that sense, right? Uh, it spoke to people. It answered a question they needed answered, uh, not just in Philemon's church, but all over the, all over the uh, Mediterranean world. Yes? The question I have is, um, do you think the other members of his home church were slave owners? Well, I, I see, that's a good question. Maybe. I have a feeling that, uh, and we know this from several of Paul's letters and other sources, that the early church, one of the things that characterized Christianity was its disregard for class and status at first. There, was, there were people in the slave class, uh, people in the, prost there were prostitutes, and there were upper crust people, all meeting together in one church. Now, sometimes that caused problems. The Corinthian correspondence deals with the fact uh, in the passage about uh, the Lord's Supper in Corinth, in Corinthians, and Paul has this phrase, not dis meeting together, but not discerning the body of Christ, which seems to be a really d uh, complex double en double entendre. Uh, the body of Christ would be, of course, the bread of the, the elements of the supper. But he complains because the Wealthy people who have time on their hands, apparently one of the things the early church did was meet and have uh, dinner together. And the last part of the dinner would be the, the Lord's Supper itself. And Paul complains because there are wealthy people getting there and eating up all the food. And by the time the poor people who had to work today get there, there's nothing left but some bread and a little grape juice, right? And he says, you guys are not discerning the body of Christ, which I think Paul means the body of Christ being all of those who gather together as, as members of Christ's body, the church, uh, you're not discerning the fact that you're, you're uh, belittling and disregarding and doing damage to, to your very own body, to the body of Christ, these, these other people. Then get to the second question. Is Paul telling his friend to take back the slave as a brother? Yes. No. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Well, see, 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 that's where I would like, that's a, that's a good, that's, well, that's where I would like, yeah, 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 that's where I would like to get back. I think uh, Paul would have been slave, against slavery. In Christ, there's neither slave nor free. I, I think, but, but here Paul is trying to be, he's so concerned with Philemon's dignity. He wants Philemon to do the right thing out of his own free will, you know, and I can understand that. Kind of. Because I don't, I don't think Paul thought this letter would be part of a, the Bible. I don't think he thought that would ever happen. That's why I'd like to get in a time machine and go back and say, now, Paul, we're going to have a Bible one day, and you're going to be in it, and people are going to be using you uh, to justify how they behave. I want you to go ahead and write a longer book that is a treatise on how 
how people ought to behave. Uh, which brings me to another thing I wanted to be sure and talk to you all about, and Philemon gives us a good opportunity to do this. Uh, we approach issue, moral and ethical issues, and we've just been trained um, to do the proof texting thing. We want to find a text or a book that says, do this, don't do that, right? Uh, uh, if we had time, I would like to read with you uh, part of Deuteronomy 14 and 15, which is, uh, we refer to it as the law of manumission in the Old Testament. Uh, the, uh, the author of Deuteronomy there says, look, uh, and he appeals to a, t a half verse that you find in Deuteronomy's version of the Ten Commandments, uh, Deuteronomy 5, that has to do uh, with the uh, Sabbath day. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Do six, work on six days and take the, you and your slaves and your oxen and your, your cattle and everybody, your sons and daughters. Everybody has Sunday off, except it's not Sunday. Everybody has Saturday off. Uh, and and the, uh, the commandment in Deuteronomy says, because you need to remember that you were slaves in Egypt and God set you free. Right? Now, the law of manumission in Deuteronomy relies on that. Remember, you were slaves, and it says you've got to treat your slaves in, in a sta by a standard which in the world at that time, the ancient Near East, the Israelite standards for treating slaves were just progressive as a whole get out, right? They were just liberal. Uh, they were humane almost in comparison, right? And this is one of those things the, the authors of Deuteronomy thought theologically as follows. The Exodus teaches us that God is in the business of liberating slaves. God is about freedom, not bondage, the house of bondage. And we have the Sabbath day as a weekly commemoration of the fact that God is a liberator God, right? So we ought to treat our slaves better. Now, it's like Paul. I want to get back, go in a time machine and go back to the author of Deuteronomy 14 and 15 and say, now let's think about this a little longer. If we take what you just said to its logical and radical conclusion, what would you have to say? God is against slavery. Period. Right? Now, this is what we have in the Bible. Remember, uh, that the people who wrote the Bible were somewhat captive to their culture, right? Uh, to think as progressively as the authors of Deuteronomy 14 and 15 did is rather remarkable if you think about it, right? So we make a serious mistake when we take that uh, insight that was not uh, pursued to its logical conclusion and we set it in concrete as though that's the way God wants it. What we ought to see instead, when you look from Exodus to Deuteronomy 14 and the commandment about the Sabbath day to Deuteronomy 14, and look through that as a lens all the way to Paul saying, Christ, there's neither uh, a slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, male nor female, and you go all the way to Philemon, you ought to say there's a trend here that we need to extend all the way out. Not, oh, but Paul didn't tell Philemon he had to set Onesimus free. You, are, you, are you with me on this? That means you can't prove text, all right? Because you're going to pick some text along that trajectory and absolutize it, concretize it. And you're going to have overlooked the whole impulse of, toward freedom and liberation that we find in the scriptural witness. Is everybody... Everybody with me so far? And I would say that applies to that, that, that notion applies to slavery. It applies to male-female relationships. It applies to just about, well, no, not just about. It applies to every moral and ethical issue we face or ever will face. Are you, are, is everybody? Okay. I, I, I mean, I, I can get up on my soapbox about that. <laughs> Well, I, I, 
I think you have to take it on a case by case basis and, and, and to answer your question. And sometimes it's not vague at all, by the way. And we just don't like to listen to it. Right. Uh, I mean, Jesus said, you know, when, what you do unto the least of these, you do, unto, you know, uh, and you, you, that you can know somebody by uh, their fruits and their fruits ought to include taking care of the poor, for example. Uh, we, we, uh, he meant that oh, that you should be willing. You know, or he meant to take care of them, those who are in spiritual poverty. Uh, we can, we, we're really good at, at, at uh, rationalizing our way out of things. Uh, but I can tell you, that, um, if you read the scripture the way I'm suggesting, uh, it's not vague on much of anything. But you have to be willing to put in a little work and, and do that tracing of a trajectory and contextualizing and paying attention to nuance that people aren't willing to do. They'll, they'll just whip out a text and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the meaning, the, if you want to put it that way, meaning is in the whole tradition, not in a given text. And you've got to work with it that way. Uh, Jews are much better than us at this, by the way. Um, but they have, a, they have training in it. And that's how they have always thought of scripture. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Well, see, I mean, there are that, that. I think there may be some of that. I, I mean, it's a, it's a very nuanced. I would really love, you know, there are all these things I would love. I, if I had a time machine, you would never see me because I'd be time machining all around. Uh, uh, but but that Sunday morning when they read that letter out loud, I'd like to be sitting where I had this kind of, you know, right straight shot at at, uh, at Philemon to see what he how he be, behaved. Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think they're probably, I mean, Paul was in prison, so what could he do? Uh, he could write a letter and threaten to come to see, him, right. you know. Uh, but I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I think it, I'd like to think it was because he was so interested in Onesimus, he wanted to not, not, you know, fail to do anything he could, you know. He may have thought, well, there's a 20% chance Philemon won't do what I'm asking him to. So I better load it up. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I have a hard time saying the slave name. I'm just going to say the slave. But he had to have faith. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, I hadn't thought about that ever. And that's a good observation. Paul said, yeah, Paul says, I wrote this letter. You want to read it? Now, uh, are you willing to take it to finally? Yeah, that, whoa. We don't know that. that. We don't know if Philemon could read. I mean, that, the, yeah, I read it to him, and I said, yeah, who knows? Uh, but um, that uh, that, that uh, question of literacy is we don't know. There, there's a whole bunch of new scholarship on that with respect to ancient Israel and the methods you have to use to try to guess it. Oh. I think we wouldn't have it in the New Testament if he hadn't. Because we don't know what Philemon. Yeah, I mean, if he'd given if no if he'd given Onesimus the letter and said now go, and Onesimus got out of town, out of sight, and turned north, you know, we would we we wouldn't have this letter. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, well, and I think I mean that's where that that's where that line I read about. Uh, Philemon's faith in all the saints, that Paul said. You have love and faith for God and in all the saints. I think, I, I think if that paragraph, uh, the Thanksgiving, where Paul describes who Philemon is, if it was accurate, right? Well, I think there are two, there are two reasons to think Philemon did what he was supposed to. One, uh, Paul thought he would, and we have the letter. Uh, if if Philemon had said, "The heck with you! Give me that letter," 
burned it in the fireplace. We wouldn't have it. 25 verses, right? Size, little, little things can be powerful. Should have been powerful. Probably was in Philemon's life. But it's an example of how um, the Western church, well, let's just say the American church, has, has learned just not to pay attention to nuance like this. Powerful nuance like that. The southern branches of the Baptist church and the Presbyterian church uh, ignored Philemon. Other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, yes. I, th I thought I saw some. Didn't I see it? Didn't I see a hand? I, okay. Um, I also want to make a commercial for if you have time, learn Greek. It's, it's a wonderful language. <laughs> and, and it opens up a lot of the Bible to you uh, if you have it available. <laughs> it's not that hard. Uh, all right. Did I, is there somebody want to ask me a question? And they're they're not. Oh well, well. I I I, I, I love this book uh, for obvious reasons. There there are others in the Bible that I consider little gems that will just knock your. Uh, Ruth is one of my favorites. Jonah, in that regard. Um, uh, well, those are two my, my two favorite little gems. They're uh, Lamentations. Lamentations will rake you over the coals, make you wish, let me up, I'm, I, uncle. Uh, <laughs> but I'm particularly fond of Ruth. Uh, and Jonah. Well, yeah. And when I teach Hebrew, it's one of those two books is the first book my students read in it. In, in Hebrew when they've got enough to start because they're short and relatively simple but powerful, jam-packed with goodies. All right, uh, join me in a word of prayer. Eternal God, we thank you that Paul wrote Philemon uh, and that apparently Philemon, the best we can guess, um, took to heart what Paul asked him to do and that this letter circulated so that we can have it. We apologize for our forebears who didn't read it carefully, didn't catch its importance. But that phenomenon, Lord, makes me want to ask you to help us from being blind in that same way about some other issue that matters, especially issues of liberation and, and the equality of human beings, the dignity of humanness, and the fact that we are in your image, all of us. And because we fear, I fear for us that we too are captives in some ways to the time and culture in which we live. Take, take the scales from our eyes so that we can see the full implication of what it means to serve a God who is in favor of liberation and who, give, who loves to the degree that he sur surrenders his son to death on a cross and who is determined to the degree that he does not let that death be the last word but brings us the hope of Easter. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.